This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. Call somebody two-faced and they may take offence. The two-faced or double-sided markets, as they're known, are actually becoming very common. These are markets set up on a high-tech platform where people trade goods or services. Professor Peter Bozertz from the California Institute of Technology has been looking at how the finance of double-sided markets work. But first of all, Peter, can you explain for me really what is a double-sided market? Um, a double-sided market is a market where actually the buyers and the sellers come together and try to come to some, ag um, some agreement to uh, trade at uh, some price. In fact, you should compare it with a single-sided market. The quintessential example of that would be eBay, where sellers go to the market and they post that they want to sell something and then they invite bids. And then after a certain number of bids, whoever bids the highest wins the auction and the thing gets sold. In uh, double-sided markets, um, it's a little bit more complicated. Any bidder can come in at any moment in time, even if there's no seller yet, and say, I want to bid so much. And all the sellers come to the same marketplace. So it's essentially an eBay 2.0, where everybody actually comes together um, in a marketplace, both the buyers and the sellers, and they trade a relatively commoditized uh, product. Um, it's a construction that's very well known from financial markets. Virtually all financial markets are organized like that. Uh, but it's actually relatively little known outside financial markets and the potential of it actually has not been realized yet. With the advent of the internet, actually, you can do a lot more as long as you have the right platform, the right, the right software in order to develop something that actually should be the uh, the next stage of, uh, of, of the eBay's. Okay, but what's actually new about this compared to, say, the old wanted column in a newspaper? I'm thinking of something like the Trading Post, Exchange in Mart, all of those newspapers yeah. that will uh, carry plenty of for sale adverts, but will also have a wanted advert and people say, I'm interested in buying a new safe uh, for up to $50 mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. What, why are people getting excited about it now? Because with, uh, let's say you want to sell a BMW uh, 230i. You're one of the sellers, you go on eBay, you advertise uh, it, and then you uh, wait until they're buyers. But there are other people who want to sell this, um, so they have to announce themselves. It's not very efficient, actually, that you get to the replication of announcements. It's the same for the other side. Um, I'm out there, I don't have a BMW 230, but I'd like to have them. Um, I'm not going to wait until somebody actually announces, so I may want to post an ad. Uh, I want a BMW 230. Well, a double-sided market actually does it in a very, very organized wa uh, way. So you set up a market for a particular uh, um, item for a particular time, and everybody's interested in buying, everybody's in interested in selling. They come together. The price mechanism that you use for that, so how you clear this market is very, very important, and that's where all the efficiencies come from. Everybody will be able to trade at a uniform price. Everybody pays the same price. Everybody gets the same price. What we know from economic theory is that ever actually everybody should prefer to be in a market like that than in this very inefficient market where you, everybody posts separately and all the buyers have to bid in all the, the, the sales markets. And how do the finance of this actually work? How do people set a price? Because after all, we're used to models of things like the stock market where people will have the bid price and the ask price. But it's slightly different when you're buying a BMW, surely. Actually, uh, we have taken a lot of uh, um, uh, cues from the stock markets, um, especially uh, a market mechanism like the Australian Stock Exchange uses, uh, which is called a limit order open book system, where you post orders to buy, which are the bids, and orders to sell, uh, which are the ask, uh, in a book, and everybody can see them. And you trade from the moment there is a match. Um, so it's actually not that far from an eBay. The only difference is that there are two sides to it, and there are lots of people involved. Um, so it's, it's organizationally uh, much more advanced, and we know from the stock market um, that it works uh, um, incredibly well. And most stock markets in the world actually are all moving towards the system that the Australian Stock Exchange uses. So how is the technology actually developed? Is it very similar to a stock market, or, or is it much more complicated than that? It's very similar to a stock market, but it, uh, you know, what happens with stock markets is that it has a lot of jargon and unnecessary uh, bells and whistles. 
Um, so you can actually simplify it, and we had to do that. So we run um, experiments in the laboratory, initially uh, on financial markets, and so we invite subjects, um, mostly college students, to come and play in our markets. We give them securities, they can trade them if they want, and we had to develop software for them to be able to trade very quickly, to be able to understand how to operate in such a market within 15 or 20 minutes. They are not professional traders. They don't know what bids and asks are. They don't know what limit orders are. They don't know what short sales are. And yet they actually have to use that within 15 or 20 minutes. So what we did is we developed software that actually just makes it very, very easy for them to understand. And in fact, the software we use now, most of our uh, subjects don't even read the instructions anymore. Just go ahead and, uh, and, and they start trading. So these students have obviously been having a lot of fun while they've been trading, but what have you learned about the ways that they trade, their personalities, and how they actually physically trade in that two-sided market? So uh, this is the interesting part. We originally looked at what happened at the systems level, at the market level. We were interested in seeing for the first time these beautiful financial models that everybody uses, um, both in business schools and outside business schools, or even in courts, uh, that nobody had actually seen at work. Right. So, in fact, actually, to the point, a lot of people think, well, it's not true, right? But yet, everybody uses it. You know? And so, we started doing some experiments on this, and actually, we were the first uh, ever to have seen these uh, models to come alive in the lab. It explains what happens at the market level, pretty much, even if, you know, at the individual level, you see a lot of strange uh, things. So, at the market level, we saw some beautiful classical asset pricing theory come about, well, as the, at the individual level, we saw a lot of um, strange things happening. So that, that got us interested in looking at individuals. And we uh, got in contact with neuroscientists who were also interested. So we started to actually do experiments with them, uh, starting with just taking human subjects, putting them in a scanner, in a functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, a scanner, to see what happens in the brain while they're making financial decisions. And we slowly are starting to understand how the human brain perceives uncertainty how it separates risk from reward, what measures of risk it uses, how it learns about risks, and how it generates cognitive biases because actually it's not recording part of the risks. Um, it's oblivious to certain aspects of the risk when these risks are not ecologically relevant. That is, you know, they have not been really very important uh, in human evolution, whereas in fact they may be important in financial markets. So, so what sort of strange things are you actually seeing with individuals? There are uh, framing effects that are very well known. The most important one being that people tend to be uh, risk-seeking for losses and risk aversion for gains. It's as if uh, humans, uh, when they're talking about a loss situation, um, they're always at the fear of disappearing, uh, losing out, dying. Uh, even in when you're talking about relatively small gambles. And, um, you know, we start to understand, uh, to understand this because the brain seems to be able to, uh, or wants to rescale everything. And things that actually, in the grand scheme of things, look not very important, the brain actually makes very important because it's actually only focused on that particular problem. And when it goes outside in the real world, problems are much bigger, it will just rescale um, um, everything. So we can we start to understand some of the biases that uh, that people have uh, documented at an individual level. So, for instance, this risk-seeking behavior for losses. Not everybody has it, and we understand the physiology uh, behind why some people actually are able to overcome this urge of a human being to uh, try to to gamble at the loss side in order to maximize the probability of survival. But surely, uh, different people have different appetites for risk. Some people Absolutely. are willing to gamble a lot more. Uh, well, that's an interesting uh, thing you bring up. The uh, attitudes towards risk um, don't seem um, to be uh, necessarily related to just risk the way we understand it, but actually much more attitudes towards uh, novelty seeking or exploration. So we're actually drifting away from categorizing people in terms of, well, this person is more risk tolerant than the other person, towards uh, a completely different view um, where you have uh, humans who are much more willing to explore new things. Um, and others um, who are uh, staying with what, the, what is certain and optimizing. Um, we are right now ex- exploring that, exploratory behavior, um, and trying to understand what, um, what ramifications it has for human behavior um, as far as addiction 
some types of addiction, like nicotine addiction, actually uh, requires you to go through a, a period where your body is screaming, don't do this, don't do this. And, and nevertheless, there are quite a few people actually who go over that period until a sufficient time has passed for the addiction to take over. So are there parallels between that kind of addiction and people who may be addicted to risky behavior, gambling? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so we think that there are uh, nice um, analogies. Um, and it's not surprising because it's the same structures of the brain that are involved with these purely financial tasks. One of the first uh, publications I was involved in in neuroscience had to do with encoding of risk and uh, risk prediction errors in the human brain. And we found some beautiful risk signals, mathematical signals, in a part of the brain that before had been associated with emotions, and in particular with disgust. Um, so when you eat something bad, that part of the brain would like to be involved in making sure you won't do this anymore in the future. Um, so that part of the brain was, was, was considered to be highly emotional. And there we found this very, very mathematical, very abstract uh, signal of risk, allowing us to better understand what emotions are for, what they're doing, um, and throwing out actually a long-standing idea in economics and in finance, including behavioral finance, that emotions are bad for you. In fact, the emotions and rational thinking are very closely related to each other. Uh, never mind that sometimes you can be over-emotional, just like you can be over-concerned about things if you start calculating too much. Uh, so this idea that emotions and rationality are opposed um, is clearly not true for, for the human being. Again, you know, then you go back to the evolutionary basis of this. Um, if that had really been bad, uh, then humans would not have been emotional anymore. We would have been wiped out by um, inhabitants from the planet Vulcan, as in Star Trek. But our environment is far more complicated. And it turns out that humans are very good at navigating this unstructured environment, chaotic environment, have very developed very good heuristics, very good mathematical tools that mathematicians have yet to figure out how it works. Right? So if you're from, from Vulcan and you've been taught in classical mathematical theory, you will not be able to solve the problems that we are faced with uh, every day. And are people calculating the risks of uh, using the model of eBay, for example, of calculating how risky is this transaction? Yes, they do. And uh, we have quite a bit of evidence how people do that. Relative to the fully rational uh, risk-neutral person, people make mistakes. They tend to be overbidding, too aggressive. Maybe because they're risk-averse, they're concerned about the way that, about not getting the item, and then you start being, becoming uh, overly aggressive. Turns out the eBay uses a mechanism that people seem to be very, very uh, comfortable with, and um, that there is a, a rational um, explanation as to how people go about doing that. With the double-sided markets, it's a little bit different because it's so complicated to analyze strategically that as a game theorist, you would wonder why would people ever want to be in a market like that. But it turns out people are perfectly comfortable with, with these markets. They actually prefer to be a market in a market like the Australian Stock Exchange that's organized that way than in many, many other uh, platforms that uh, the game theorists can explain. So there is something that your brain can do uh, that is very, very comfortable with, which is incredibly complicated and that the theorists haven't been able to understand themselves. That is, if you were to ask a theorist, can you give me a robot? Can you program this robot so, a robot so that this robot can really trade in um, these double-sided markets? The answer would be, no, I don't know how to do that. I can give this robot some uh, very simple trading rules, and we know that it's being done out there. There is algorithm trading, there's robot trading but they will not uh, reach this level of sophistication that uh, humans have. Maybe the speed, of course, you know, they're much faster than humans, but in the big scheme of things, uh, they're not there yet. And I'm sure many people will be scared if we do have robots trading for themselves on eBay. <laughs> Peter Pozzertz, thank you very much. Thank you. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.com dot unsw dot edu dot au